Welcome to Detachment 128's podcast. This is a series of recordings that we're having this semester where we're interviewing special guests, we're chatting with cadets, and we're understanding ROTC at a deeper level. Today, we get to talk about Women's History Month, and we are joined by Cadet Senos. Welcome, Cadet Senos. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. So I always start off podcasts really with kind of like an icebreaker question, something off the wall. So my question for you is, do you prefer, because today we have to set our clocks back an hour, do you prefer spring forward or do you prefer fall back? Which of the two is your favorite? That's a really good question. I definitely have to say that I would prefer spring forward just because, you know, we're losing an hour of sleep, but it kind of motivates me to be a little bit more productive. And I really like coming home and having it still be light out so I can go, you know, go for a run or take out my dog and um, be able to be outside with my friends. So I'd have to agree with you because I, I love the, the fact that I can walk out of, let's say like work and it's not pitch black outside. I actually have some daylight left. I totally feel that. So before we dive too far into the weeds, women have this month, really women have had, you know, the past several hundreds of years. Um, and more particularly when we're talking about Women's History Month, I'd like to focus on the Air Force aspect of it. Um, so to take a stab in the dark, when do you think the first female Air Force or airman, when, when, uh, when did a female join the Air Force for the first time? That's a really good question. Hmm. I'm curious to, to hear your guess. <laughs> and this is, for people listening and watching, this is not planned. Like, I specifically did not tell her the answer. So I want to see <laughs> what your guess is. Um, I want to have to go with maybe around 1955. 1955? You're actually not too far off. I have my little article here that I can pull up. So it was at 1948. You're seven years off. That's not bad. And it was Esther McGowan Blake. She was the first woman in the Air Force, having enlisted in the Women in the Air Force. The first minute of the first hour of the first day, regular Air Force duty was authorized for women, July 8th, 1948. That's incentive. Dang. Um, but yeah, that is when it all started. From 1948, June 8th, of 1948, till now, how do you think the current status of women in the military is right now? Just kind of want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Um, I definitely think over the years we've made leaps and bounds um, across all branches, all of them, including even the Space Force now. Um, so I know that there was a lot of issues with gender in general, but also with race and, you know, different socioeconomic economic statuses um, and things of that nature. So I definitely think that we've When it comes to certain career fields, especially in the army, um, we didn't see a lot of women in infantry for such a long time, like on the line. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, women become army rangers and, and green berets and all of these different career fields. And I know a lot of my friends um, in Air Force and Army in general, they're going into these rated positions. So they're flying or they're, you know, going to be on the front lines as uh, infantry officers. So it's just really amazing to see how far um, we've progressed over the years. But at the same time, you know, we still have our internal biases and the things that we struggle with across the board, whether it be men or women. So I know my friends, the ones who are already in, say that um, sometimes they feel, their airmen feel like they can't really go to their superiors just because they're men and they don't have that shared experience. So there's kind of a lack of female mentors, um, but that's something, you know, they're still trying to work on with retention and recruiting. So the numbers are going up across, you know, all branches, but it's still something that, um, that we're struggling with. The Air Force is one of the better ones. I'm, I'm here. So that kind of, you know, <laughs> says something, but there's still, you know, sexism that 
females in the military face every day. And there's still the existence of the old boys network, um, especially in career fields dominated by males, dominated um, and those rated positions. So those, those females feel like they have to work a little bit harder just to prove themselves. So they may be doing the same amount of work as a man and you know, it may be even better, but just because they're a woman, they feel like they're not going to be listened to and they have to speak up a little louder. Um, but they also have to face, you know, the fact that if they project themselves and if they come in the room super confident, they may, that may have their own consequences. Like, oh, this, this, she's too bossy or um, she's too in my face, even though her temperament could be the exact same as a male's. So that's still something that we're definitely trying to work on. And I know, again, some of my friends struggle with um, uncertain work schedules and with the impacts of deployments on their family lives can especially be tough because they're, you know, the head of the household and having to deal with, um, you know, having kids, juggling kids, but also balancing the work life. So right. I think the Air Force has done a really great job of, you know, dealing with that, especially when it comes to dependent care, um, like hair day to facilities and stuff like that. Um, so I definitely think that we're moving in the right direction. We just, we still have a little bit to work on. You mentioned the old boys network. What do you mean by that? So I think within certain career fields, certain positions um, that may be, you know, male dominated, they, they like to have, joke around and they like to kind of, in their own social circles, focus on the men and, you know, say, hey, like, do you want to grab a beer with like the boys or they have different social cues that they use um, to kind of, you know, not include the female. So they may talk about sports or they may bring up like certain topics that they feel like only men can relate to and, and talk about. So I think that's still something that we're working on. Gotcha. Kind of like how if we watch some old war movies, it's primarily male dominated in the, the military. Exactly. So they purposely, gotcha. whether it's purposely or not purposely, um, try to cut females out of the conversations. But again, I think we're definitely making leaps and bounds from where we used to be. I heard um, a rumor. I don't, I haven't really fact checked it, but I know in Disney Plus's new series of like shows that they're trying to create, they were doing a what if series, I think. And I think it was a, a what if this superhero wasn't this character? Or what if this person who traditionally is a guy was replaced by a girl superhero? And I think the one that stood out to me was I think Agent Carter from Captain America was going to take Captain America's shoes. So it was like a giant, like super strong uh, female character instead of the male character that we all know so that like I think of regularly when I think about like there are some women in the military who quite frankly like scare me of how like muscular and strong they are I'm like you belong here more than me sometimes but uh yeah that's that's a good point I think I agree with you I've seen the the progress of of how you know women are treated not only in the military but just in society in general um i think we are working towards you know a positive direction but it is so cool to see people like um like recently we have um we have a new chief master sergeant of the air force and chief of staff of the air force but our chief master sergeant of the air force joanna s bass is the first female in that role so it's pretty cool to see that, you know, we're working in a direction and you can say that we're going in a positive direction, but it's nice to see milestones along the way. So I feel like this is a nice milestone um, to kind of look back and be like, hey, first female head honcho, pretty much. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on that? No, I, I think that's definitely true. We've definitely seen across the board over all the branches, um, females move up in the ranks and it's it's just amazing to see. I watched so many TED Talks. I'm a big TED Talk person. And I've actually watched one of her TED Talks and she was just talking about um, 
her time in the military. She's actually raised as an army dependent, which is pretty cool because we have army in my family. Um, so I know that she has a ton of service um, experience in like joint service and special operations experience. She was deployed a bunch. Um, she worked in Operation Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom. So uh, to be blunt, she's kind of a badass. So a couple of years ago, <laughs> one of my friends sent me a TED talk. I had no idea who Chief Bass was. And I clicked on the link and it said, what female military leadership can teach us about overcoming self-doubt? And it was great because I was just going through FTP and this is field training prep for those who don't know. So this is kind of the, um, the transition from, you know, becoming a sophomore into uh, the junior position. So it's your, it's your way of saying, hey, I've made it this far um, to continue on in the program. I'm contracted now and I'm gonna be a, a second lieutenant. But anyways, so I was watching this TED right. talk and it was really, really cool because at the time I was just going through a lot of periods of like self-doubt and, you know, working on my self-confidence in order to, you know, catch up with my peers and, and just make it known that like I'm here and, and I'm here to stay and I'm ready to, to kick butt. So she really inspired me because she was talking about um, just challenges that women have faced in general and then her own personal experiences. So she was talking about, you know, how she was climbing the ranks of leadership, um, what she did to overcome these challenges. And she kind of overall just gives a look into what the Air Force is and again, where she got, how she got um, to where she is today. So she was stressing that just in general, the number one thing that, you know, people complain about is communication, 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 communication. It's always something that we struggle with, not just in the military, but just in society. So she said that she had a lot of challenges with um, dealing with interpersonal skills and human relations and stuff like that. And she was talking about how some of us possess these unconscious and conscious biases. And that kind of puts a dent in, um, you know, our own, our own self-confidence and the ability to perceive ourselves a certain way. So she was saying that her biggest challenge was not actually, you know, an external factor. It was her. Um, she said that my, my biggest challenge was me, her and her self-limiting beliefs which I could relate to. And she was just talking about the process of, you know, how she got over that and the people who inspired her to where she, she got today. So it was really, really great. I definitely recommend um, everyone take a look. It's only about a seven minute video. Again, the title is what female military leadership can teach us about overcoming self-doubt. So. Yeah, that's awesome. For, for however you're watching this podcast, whether it's, you know, on the YouTube or elsewhere, I'll have a link in the show notes or the description for that video so that way you can check it out. That's, I've seen that. It's an amazing video. Again, highly recommend watching that. Um, when someone is, is watching a video like that, when Chief Bass is, is speaking or um, someone of a high position of authority who's, you know, kind of telling her story or his, his or her story, uh, when it's a, a man or a female, or a male or a female, sometimes that story can get perceived differently. And what I mean by that is, I remember watching a video of previous chief of staff, um, David O'Golfine, telling a story about when he was in an aircraft and he was, I think, shot down or something like that. And um, I thought to myself, like, wow, that's, that's like the epitome of adrenaline rush. Like, you're, you're in combat at that point. And um, then hearing stories about you know, Chief Bass saying how female leadership can like skyrocket you for success. And I almost perceive that differently as in like, that's really good, almost better because she's overcoming boundaries, you know, within the military and she's just knocking walls down. Um, and obviously you can see where that got her. Do you think that when people are listening to speakers who come from different origin stories, do you think that that has an impact on the leadership style? Whether, uh, let's use David L. Goldfein and, you know, Joanne S. Bass as examples for, for that. 
do you think that if they are telling a story that someone's going to perceive leadership differently? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think they right off the bat, um, you know, when you're looking up someone and trying to figure out who they are, you know, what they do, how they tick, the first thing you do is look up their backstory, you know, who they are, um, where were they were born, what kind of family they come from. So yeah, like their bio. Exactly, exactly. So everything matters. So for me, again, like because we have so many um, like army officers enlisted in my family, that kind of, you know, triggered me like in a good way because I was like, wow, I can relate to this person. I can, you know, understand her own experiences. So I definitely think, again, as she mentioned, we have those conscious versus unconscious biases. So I think that it's a really important question to bring up because we may not even know that when we're taking in, you know, new data, new information, we may not even understand, you know, how or why we relate to a certain person or why we don't. So I think that it's just always important when you're watching these videos or just learning about people in general um, to just kind of be very conscious about it and, you know, question, hey, this is what I like about his or her leadership style, or this is what I don't like, but why? Always ask that question of why. Why is this, you know, sticking out to me? Why is this important? And even right. if I don't like this certain skill set or, you know, this set of beliefs, what can I do? What can I take from this person in order to become a better leader? Because we all have very different personalities. And, you know, I'm never going to be Chief Bass or General Goldfein, but what can I kind of take from their toolbox and implement that into my own life? So I think that's really important recognizing that we don't necessarily have limitations, but we always want to be extremely genuine um, in the way we like talk to people, treat people, and in our own leadership styles, because that's what attracts other people to you. And that's what, um, that's how people gain trust from you. So I think authenticity and genuineness is really important. So. I totally agree. That was well said. Now, uh, before we leave today, I do have another off the wall question for you. Um, there has been controversy across the nation and no one has made a, a clear cut decision yet. So I'd love to get your opinion on whether you put cereal in the bowl before you put milk or do you put milk in the bowl before you put cereal? The world's gotta know. <laughs> So you always put cereal before the milk. If you don't, I think you're just a psychopath. Um, I think everyone, <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all relate to this. And if not, again, you're just, you're just a psychopath because who likes, take Frosted Flakes or Lucky Charms, for example. How do you like that? How do you like milk more than Lucky Charms? Like it's just, Lucky Charms is, it's just goodness melting your mouth. Milk is just, you know, the after effect. So. so you think that if you put one in before the other, you're going to get an uneven proportion? I definitely agree because when you're, you know, you get up in the morning and you're super hungry and you're ready to eat, um, you, the first thing you pour in, I feel like you always pour in more than the second item. So. Overcompensate compensate sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So. I hear that. Always, always cereal. Well, for the sake of people continuing to watch this podcast, I will not disclose my opinion, but um, <laughs> thank you for coming. I really appreciate you carving out some time for us to talk about this. Um, for those of you who are watching the podcast, if you really enjoyed watching this, we've had a couple that we've already reported. We've, this is our fifth podcast. So um, feel free to click on our profile. You can see probably the previous four. Um, and if you're watching this and we might have some some even newer podcasts that you can go watch. So please feel free to check those out. We always have a fun time here. We look forward to seeing you again soon. And Cadet Senos, thank you again for, for joining. Thank you for having me. This was great.